So Michael, uh, give us a sense of how you're approaching frontline therapy. Um, do you see patients that you think are undertreated who come to Duke who maybe have not gotten their optimal therapeutic opportunity with the VEGF TKI? Do you ever go back to some of the things that they've received before because you thought that they didn't get uh, a, a fair a dose and schedule and an appropriate management of their toxicity? So how, you'd, how are you approaching patients in the frontline setting? Well, that's a great point. I think um, in terms of patients that are referred from the community, sometimes it can be very frustrating if you see patients that like Tony was saying are kind of treated willy-nilly through several different lines and you're looking back through the notes, looking back through the radiology reports and wondering, you know, did they really progress or were they really intolerant of these medicines with optimal supportive care? Um, so, so you're right, you know, a lot of times I try to understand what, what uh, therapies they've been through and sometimes end up putting them back on a therapy that they've already been on and I've had some, some good successes with that. Again, you know, it takes a lot of counseling of the patient, really, you know, telling them what side effects to expect, kind of coaching them through that. Um, like Eric said, basically letting them know that, you know, we're going to get the best benefit if we can achieve the highest dose intensity. It's a partnership. Um, working with our advanced practice providers, our nurses, to get, give them that kind of uh, approach of, of great supportive care. So, David, we've gotten a, a better understanding of the frontline approach. Um, one of the things that we've struggled a bit with, and I think Tony mentioned that uh, uh, clearly, is when we think about doing trials, we use very strict, strict criteria for what we call progression. They have to meet rhesus criteria. They have to have a certain dimension. Those dimensions take them off study. Um, and, and what we learn in the clinic is that there are many patients who very well may have rhesus progression but clinically you're doing quite well. Um, so one of the questions that comes up for both you and for Eric, first you and then Eric, is, is what constitutes clinical progression? How do we help our colleagues in the clinics around the country uh, decide how to evaluate imaging, especially when we see many imaging evaluations in their reports where very small amounts of tumor change or constituted tumor growth on a radiology report, but when we see the patient, they continue to tolerate what we do well and, uh, and seem to be benefiting. So how do, you, how do you navigate that? So I think that before you look at the scan, you need to look at the patient. And if the patient's well, that's an important piece of information, tolerating therapy well. And then you need to actually look at the scan. So many's the time we've had patients that have come in and they've been switched off their first line VEGF TKI and there have been a couple of percentage points change in disease that was already there. Um, and the, the radiologist has said this is progression in the report, but no one's actually looked at it and said, well, yeah, this, this is 20% growth, which is what we use in Rhesist. Even if a patient gets to 20% uh, growth via Rhesist, I think there's a, uh, sometimes I'll say, look, you're doing well. If I switch you to another therapy, you may not tolerate it as well and you have slow growth and you don't have any new lesions that are in critical areas, why don't we just do another scan in eight to 12 weeks to see where we are? And we're talking about a disease that intrinsically oscillates on scan. And if you examine patients when we're doing these intermittent schedules of different drugs, most particularly sunitinib, and they have palpable nodes, they'll go up and down if you see them a week apart. So I think that we need to be aware that there's an oscillation in the disease that should not be confused with progression and that at the end of the day we need to integrate the imaging into our clinical decision making. And most patients, if you want to leave them on for an extra scan, are fine. Um, and and I, I think I'm fine with that. What can happen in the community where this very compressed practice is the report's read, sometimes now by the patient before it gets to the physician, and the patient says, the radiologist says I have progression. And they've already researched the next line of therapy. So uh, we have the opportunity, in our practices, we're usually very well supported. We have advanced uh, nurse practitioners uh, and PAs that help us uh, who will say, hmm, well, I was looking at this and it, the report says progression, but it's not a very big change. And Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Smith are well. I'm thinking I, we should leave the patient on. And usually that's the right uh, decision. A community practice oncologist who has their three patients a year who gets a report 
is often pushed to move uh, by a very small inflection in disease that may be part of the natural variation. So Eric, um, there's a phenomenon taking place in our clinics and across the country using either next generation sequencing or circulating tumor cells or some other non-invasive biomarker often obtained in the blood. Do we have any insight into whether or not we're gonna be able to use that to identify how people and when people are progressing? So in 2017, the answer is no, but is it what we have to move towards? Absolutely. We have an increasingly large number of drugs. We do not have enough patience or time to really be able to do two drug combinations of 50 drugs to be able to actually um, determine whether they're good for, for renal cell carcinoma in general or for a patient in specific. So we have to develop biomarkers. And these biomarkers could either be imaging based where um, a holy grail would be, can you actually image a tumor and look at the ratio of T cells to tumor cells? And not only that, are the T cells healthy or not? for example. We don't have that, but this is the sort of moonshot idea that we should be working towards from an imaging perspective. From a circulating microenvironment perspective, clearly the tumor is shedding DNA, it's shedding cytokines, uh, chemokines, and a variety of other things that are really giving us an idea of what that organ that we call a cancer is doing, and that's the organ made up of the cancer cells and the various immune cells. Uh, Monty Powell has a abstract at, uh, at uh, GeoASCO this year looking at a circulating tumor DNA using the Gardent platform. And this is a platform that uses 71 or, or, or looks at a mutational analysis of 71 genes asking the question of whether or not A, are they there, and B, have they changed. And this study demonstrated a couple of interesting things. One is that uh, P53 mutations, which is not something we usually ascribe as being a common uh, uh, mutation in renal cell carcinoma A was at a relatively high rate, or higher than we would expect looking at TCGA or other things, and B at the time of progression went up. VHL, NF1, several other things were, 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 were not changed as much. Now the downside of Gardent is that it does not have the, some of the most important VA, uh, renal cell carcinoma genes. It does not have BAP1, PBR1, SETD2. Therefore, it's an inadequate platform for renal cell carcinoma as it stands. We need to develop customized panels like this. What will it mean from, from a, a therapy perspective? Can we actually drug uh, a, a target P53 mutations at this point in time? No, but I, I think it's things like this as well as psych cir circulating cytokines and angiogenesis factors that if we do, the, do our work and we can link that back to, to real defined tumor biology, that's gonna make a big difference.